The private pension system in America has grown to become a $4 trillion institution that affects the lives of millions of people. Today, these pension plans are the largest investors on Wall Street. The American Express Company offered the first employer-sponsored plan in 1875, and shortly thereafter, other employers began to follow suit. But it would be 100 years before President Ford would sign legislation known as ERISA in the wake of tragic tales of pensions wiped out by bankruptcies, unsavory business practices, and harsh eligibility requirements. Uh, I remember going up to uh, the hearings with horror stories of one kind or another. Somebody, uh, uh, somebody has his or her pension taken away a week or two before retirement age. So many plans were seemingly designed not to give people pensions but to promise people's pension and not deliver. Many workers had to work right until the absolute day of retirement in order to get their pension, and if they had retired before that or were laid off, they lost the pension completely. Probably one of the greatest contributions of ERISA was to basically force us to recognize that most Americans never got a pension and most Americans never will get a pension. When this penetrated the public consciousness, there was no turning back pension reform. Today, private pension plans are highly regulated, with three government agencies administering various parts of the law. We have hundreds of rules that, that are unbelievably complex, and in many cases they overlap. Often we have two or three rules that are achieving the same objective. It seems to me that we have now an alphabet soup of pension regulation. It is clearly a case of regulatory overkill. Private pension plans are crucial to retirement security for millions of Americans. But our private pension system does not work so well for millions of others. We worry about what's going to happen to Medicare. We worry about what's going to happen to Social Security. We worry about all of these things. We see it in the headlines every day. Uh, about people are not going to have enough income off of these programs to protect themselves. There are tens of millions of people in this country who are nearing retirement who are not adequately prepared. More than half of the workforce in this country has no employer-provided pension plan. We have a two-class society in retirement. We have very, very well-off retirees. And we have so many who can't pay their bills. Who are the winners and losers? What can each of us do to increase our chances of finishing in the winner's circle? And what risks and hurdles stand in the way of living the American dream? The golden years. Today's the day I get my gold. Watch it change. You grave with 30 years of service and my name. Men with pinstripe suits and ties shake my hand as they walk by. The day's a day I get my gold. Watch it change. Before we had pension plans in America, older people kept working as long as they could. And when working became impossible or unbearable, they had to rely upon their personal savings and very often family members to shoulder their care and support. But as the nation became more industrialized, this undirected system of old age security, or more aptly, insecurity, became intolerable. Massive train wrecks periodically illustrated the implications of an engineer's failing eyesight or a brakeman's weakened arms. Employers and society in general found it necessary to develop orderly plans that would encourage or force retirement of older workers unable to perform their duties. 
The American Express Company, a railroad freight forwarder, set up our nation's first formal pension plan in 1875. The company extended assistance to anyone injured or worn out in the service and set allowances at half salary. The plan provided a benefit at age 65 of $500 per year. By 1919, 38 railroads had plans covering 75% of railroad workers. For the most part, pensions were regarded more as gifts in recognition of long and faithful service than contractual rights. It was not surprising that organized labor developed serious misgivings about company programs and largely opposed them, preferring higher wages instead. In the early years of the century, unions were very suspicious of employer pension plans. They basically saw it with some real justification as a way to win the loyalty of workers toward the employer and wean them from unions and the, uh, the appeal of union solidarity. In 1918, Andrew Carnegie opened up a new chapter in American pension history. The Carnegie Foundation established the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association for the express purpose of operating the nation's first insured pension arrangement. Over the next century, it would grow to be the largest pension plan in the world. Unlike insurance company pension plans, those administered and underwritten by employers sometimes failed. The collapse of the Morris Packing Company plan in 1923 exposed weaknesses in the U.S. private pension system. It was among the most generous, if not the most generous, pension plan in the United States at that time. And the company had been on the ropes for quite a few years. And perhaps because it was on the ropes, it paid its workers not with salary increases, but with promises of very generous pension benefits. But when the company went out of business, the assets on hand were insufficient to pay for the benefits promised to workers. Workers sued, and there they lost in court. And what they discovered in court is no matter what your manager said, it's what's written in the fine print of the pension document that matters. And what it said in the pension document was that the company's liability was limited to an annual contribution of $25,000 a year that it had to make, and which it duly did make, and that was it. That the employees had a claim against the pension fund, but not against the corporation. For the pension institution as a whole, the implications of that court decision were alarmingly clear. Then, in the 1930s, the Great Depression sent another massive shockwave through the nation's fragile private pension system. The country was in a very deep recession. Uh, there was a lot of vulnerability in the country. A lot of old people were worried about uh, how they would survive. A lot of young people were worried about how they would survive, whether they would have jobs. And there was really a unification of a lot of families to demand a pension system that would both take care of the old in terms of providing their income and also removing them from the workforce. The severity of this terrible economic crisis and the resultant shifting political climate precipitated a strong interest in some sort of government-administered pension program. The 1930s, you really saw two movements uh, that were very important in the development of the pension institution. The first was a movement of railroad workers, young and old, to secure the pension system for railroad workers. The second movement, which was much broader based, was the Townsend Movement, um, where you had uh, a physician out in California named Townsend who uh, came up with this great idea for taking care of the old people and solving the Depression, you just write checks. To get the country out of the Depression and to end old age poverty, Townsend proposed a $200 monthly government benefit to every person age 60 and older who retired from active employment and who spent the entire amount within a month of its receipt. The Townsend movement really struck a nerve throughout the country and mobilized the population in a way that the politicians in Washington had no idea that there was this kind of broad sentiment out there. Never since my President Roosevelt took the initiative 
and proposed a social insurance program as part of what became known as the New Deal, a package of reforms adopted to hasten the country's economic and social recovery from the Great Depression. Sponsors of private plans resisted the earliest designs, fearing critical damage to their own programs. But with the inception of Social Security, it became apparent that the financial resources of the elderly would increasingly come from three sources. Social Security, employer pensions, and individual savings. Disputes over pensions caused negotiations in the auto, steel, coal, and other basic industries to freeze up during the summer of 1949. The breakthrough came not in steel, but in the much younger and more vigorously growing auto industry. The United Auto Workers president, Walter Ruther, was labor's primary champion of pension benefits. Ford and the UAW signed an agreement in 1949 to pay pensions, paving the way for other union plans. The pattern set by unionized companies helped drive practice in all of American business. Defined benefit plans were ideal for the, the period when they were uh, starting a plan for the benefit of a group of employees, many of whom were near retirement or midway through their career. So you create the obligation before you have a nickel in the pension fund, and then you worry about funding it later. The pension landscape would begin to change as employers began to manage their own pension plans with the help of a number of prominent actuaries who left insurance companies to set up their own benefit consulting firms. Through the 1940s, the insurance companies dominated the, the pension field. Actuaries could tell the employers how fast their pension costs were going to rise and how to fund them in a safe, sound way. It was only in the 50s that the banks realized that this was a source of, of revenue if they were to begin to invest the assets of pension plans. And consulting actuarial firms uh, saw a, a, a source of business if they were to become consultants to the employers and, and banks. So there was a, a real battle, a real battle developed between insurance companies and and banks. Pensions flourished during the 1950s and 60s through collective bargaining and a robust growing economy. But the large amounts of assets in pension trusts would become a source of temptation for some. Probably the most colorful uh, figure to walk across the pension uh, history was uh, Jimmy Hoffa uh, of the Teamsters Union who used pension plans as a vehicle for, uh, for enhancing the, his own power, the power and wealth of his friends and associates. He used uh, Teamster pension fund money to finance casinos in Las Vegas, did all kinds of crazy things using the pension fund. Congressional hearings in the mid-50s, led by Senator John McClellan, spotlighted ripoffs in multi-employer welfare benefit plans. While not pensions, these union-run plans provided life, health, and disability benefits. The abuses uncovered led to the enactment of the Welfare and Pension Plans Disclosure Act in 1958. But the statute would prove to be inadequate. Disclosure alone would not prevent abuses in welfare or pension benefit plans. The world is very in 1962, now. President Kennedy ordered a broad examination of the entire pension and welfare benefit institution. Kennedy established a cabinet-level committee, chaired by Secretary of Labor Willard Wirtz, to conduct a comprehensive review of pensions in the nation. Pension plans were found to have stringent requirements for earning a right to a pension a concept called vesting. There would be much talk about the situation in which an employer might have a pension plan which was to vest when the employee became 65. The employer could then, as the law was uh, stood then, could then discharge that employee a month or two before. And that seemed an awful thing. 
That was the vesting problem. Efforts have been made on behalf of uh, the Kennedy administration and to a lesser extent the Johnson administration, uh, which was sorely divided within itself about the desirability or feasibility of pension reform, to put forth some legislation along these lines. And each time they tried, for one reason or another, it got shot down. I always thought that probably the principal opposition for management came because the requirement for vesting would be expensive in the sense that it would eliminate the possibility of uh, cutting somebody off just before the vesting period. I think, I think management's principal objection to it was that the vesting uh, requirement would take away a piece of liberty which uh, was there before. But the problems exposed in the private pension system could not be swept under the rug. Law professor Merton Bernstein wrote a book in 1964 documenting cases where trivial technicalities would disqualify workers from a pension. But the book pointed out a more fundamental problem. If somebody worked within two weeks of reaching age 65, but lost his job, didn't quit, lost his job, and therefore didn't literally meet the age 65 requirement, the courts would say, sorry, you're not eligible, you're a loser. Well, that seemed to me to be totally out of sync with the social purpose of private pension plans. More troublesome than the Teamsters activities was the spectacular collapse of the Studebaker Auto Company. When Studebaker closed its doors, it signaled a more fundamental problem than Jimmy Hoffa's backdoor casino loans. You had a, a major but smaller automobile manufacturer that you might say ran out of gas. It had to close down. It closed down all of its American plants. There was an insufficient amount of money in the pension fund, and there were going to be pension promises coming out of the Stubaker pension plan that were not going to be fulfilled. There were not very many people who knew that as a result of the Studebaker closing back in uh, 1963, when some 4,400 people lost some or all of their vested benefits, that in the aftermath of that, some workers had actually committed suicide because they were just not in a, prepared to live off of welfare. That was not something that they could accept, that they could tolerate. Nobody knew about that. In February 1967, Senator Jacob Javits of New York took center stage by introducing his own comprehensive pension reform bill. He tried to stay clear of the tax committees and the powerful House Ways and Means Committee chairman, Wilbur Mills, who was dead set against pension legislation. There was a serious clash between the conservative business community and conservative labor unions on the one hand and progressive labor unions and grassroots reformers on the other hand. Uh, the conservatives were scared to death of any kind of reform. From the corporate side, you had the reaction that uh, this was another interference by the government in a private sector activity, that it was more regulation, and that what was really at stake here was a collective bargaining relationship between the union and the company, and it should stay there, and the government should keep its hands out of th that uh, uh, that operation. I think behind all of that they were concerned that the economic power positions that they had built up would somehow be taken away from them or challenged and they just wanted not to be regulated. Pension reformers launched a concerted campaign to influence public opinion. Gordon and other reformers had a fat portfolio of horror stories. There was a lack of definition of employee benefit rights. As a matter of fact, the plan participants had virtually no rights. There was usually no vesting prior to retirement. Uh, the plan could be terminated at any time without any obligation on the part of the employer to make good on any uh, funding 
deficiencies. There were wholesale stories, tragedies, of people who lost their pension because the plant shut down or because they were too sick and they couldn't work until the day of retirement because if you were not there on the day of retirement, you didn't get your pension. You had to work to the end. I felt so strongly about this whole thing, I couldn't understand anybody disagreeing. This was a monumental task, and for many, many years, Javits really stood alone trying to get this thing done. The breakthrough didn't occur until about 1971 where Javits uncorked a study showing the loss of benefits in pension plans. And when the media found out about the study and were able to put it together with all these letters and telegrams of complaint from individual participants, they realized that from that point on, the pension system was vulnerable, extremely vulnerable, and that it had become a first-class political issue and attention had to be paid to it. There must be thousands, maybe millions of them, that's getting the same song and dance that my husband got. When they reach their time for retirement, there is no funds to pay them. Where does, this, where does all this money go that's been paid into these pensions? I'm not at all sure that the that ERISA would have been enacted when it was if it had not been for this NBC program, Pensions, a Broken Promise. What that did, and those kinds of documentaries, uh, was to say, well, wait a while. This isn't something that's just happening in South Bend, Indiana. That's happening right here where I work. When this penetrated the public consciousness, there was no turning back pension reform. From 1973 through mid-74, four committees of Congress worked diligently on legislative language. This was a dynamic process. Dynamic not only from the point of view of the various bills that uh, were introduced, but dynamic also from the point of view that in each body of the Congress, you had two committees that were claiming jurisdiction over this bill. The clash between these groups uh, was such that historically it means no movement at all, because one side or the other does not give an inch. And as soon as it was sent over to the Finance Committee, the Finance Committee succeeded in gutting the entire bill, which was like a declaration of war against the Labor Committee. I think one of the things that are engaged in the controversy at that time was the almost complete opposition from the business community and from our collective bargaining partners. They were adamantly opposed to this legislation. And it was going through at the time of a Republican administration. So we were on an uphill battle. This is a monumental bill, a great reform in American life, and should at long last give our older citizens a real feeling that they can, together with Social Security, have a decent income in their older years. After years of wrangling, ERISA was passed virtually unopposed and became the first major piece of legislation to hit the desk of the new president. Gerald Ford signed the measure into law on Labor Day, September 2nd, 1974, 100 years after the first private pension plan was started in America. I'll make the big man his fortune one more day. Then at five o'clock he'll send me on my way. I've been a working man since birth, and now this watch is all I'm worth. Today's the day I get my gold watch and chain. The late Senator Jacob Javits called Arissa 
the greatest development in the life of the American worker since Social Security. Few would disagree. Senator Javits was the indispensable man. Uh, without Senator Javits, there would not have been any ERISA. Established what you might call a governance system that made sure that these promises way out there in the future had a pretty good chance of being met. ERISA had multiple objectives. One thing it wanted to do was take pension plans and have them be better funded than they used to be. It accomplished that. ERISA wanted to basically have more individuals who are participants get a vested benefit. And we've seen the number, the proportion of those with a vested benefit more than double. The third thing it wanted to do through the creation of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation was assure that in the event a plan sponsor goes out of business and the defined benefit plan isn't adequately funded, that benefits will still be paid, and it has accomplished that. ERISA does not require that employers provide pensions, but companies that do must meet minimum standards. Pension plans must offer a joint and survivor annuity to married participants. ERISA requires that the funding status of a pension plan be examined and certified periodically by an actuary enrolled under the law. It also prescribes detailed reporting and disclosure requirements for pension plans and requires that the funds be handled prudently and in the best interest of the participants and beneficiaries. There is very little disclosure required to workers and very little reporting to the government. So basically workers and the government had no real way of knowing what the plan's fiduciaries were doing. In fact, the scandalous conduct of the trustees of the Central States Teamsters Pension Fund was a major impetus for the fiduciary responsibility provisions of ERISA. ERISA effectively addressed these issues. The significance of ERISA is that it provided uh, secure protections to employees so that they could have some comfort in being assured that their pensions would be delivered as promised. There are two basic types of plan design, a defined benefit and a defined contribution. A defined benefit plan provides a specific benefit at retirement for each year of service. It is usually based on a percentage of the final pay a worker was receiving when he or she left their job. Like an annuity provided by insurance companies, a defined benefit plan provides lifetime retirement income. A final pay pension plan is one in which the individual's pension is typically determined based on their salary, his or her salary, during the last five years of employment. So for example, a person who's hired at age 25, who retires at age 65, after participating for 40 years in such a plan, will have all 40 years pension credits determined using those last five years of pay. The other major type of retirement plan is a defined contribution plan. In a defined contribution plan, such as the popular 401k plan, each participant has an individual account which is credited with contributions and investment earnings. Employers usually match 401k contributions made by employees. The participant is usually offered a range of investment options to choose from, and the participant bears the risk and rewards of investment performance. Defined contribution plans are not insured by the government. Workers in a defined benefit plan will get a retirement benefit for as long as they live. Every month they'll get a check. It's not a function of their investing skill or their investing luck. They don't have to worry about outliving it. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation insures two types of defined benefit plans. Single employer plans sponsored by an individual company and multi-employer pension plans. These are collectively bargained arrangements with two or more unrelated employers and usually cover a specific trade or industry. Shortly after the enactment of ERISA, a number of single employer plans terminated without sufficient assets to pay pension benefits, handing PBGC the unfunded pension obligations. There were certainly uh, some underfunded plans, particularly in industries such as steel, airlines, and auto. 
And those underfunded plans, when they terminated, began to increase the size of the deficit uh, for the PBGC Single Employer Termination Insurance Program. Within eight short years, we became one of the major beneficiaries of, the, of ERISA, the Pension Protection Guarantee, because we had companies that were shutting down and plants that uh, were not able to provide the full pension to their workers. But little did we think of that at that time in 1974. This was not something that we were enacting merely because we knew we were on the rocks and we needed some protection. PBGC's operating deficit soared and critics warned of another savings and loan crisis. As a result, the Congress had to relook and rethink the manner in which that program was going to be operated. Congress passed the Single Employer Pension Plan Amendments Act in 1986 to make it harder for employers to escape their pension obligations by terminating underfunded plans, allowing only employers in financial distress to end their plans. The initial funding rules were not as uh, strong as, as they probably should have been. And the premiums certainly weren't adequate given the number of plans that had terminated. But more importantly, employers could terminate a plan and even though they would continue in existence. So the Congress said this, this is the loophole that's going to have to be closed. Further changes in law were necessary to bolster the financial position of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. The Pension Protection Act of 1987 and the Retirement Protection Act of 1994 required better funding and raised government insurance premiums, especially for underfunded plans. PBGC is financially healthier than we've ever been before. After 21 consecutive years of deficits, We've now run surpluses three years in a row. We've built a $5 billion cushion that will protect the insurance program in the event of an economic downturn. We think that we've righted the ship and that we've put PBGC in a very good position for many years to come. While the problem of underfunded pension plans was addressed in legislation, another problem came to the fore, which was that there were plans that were overfunded and under the law as it was structured, the employer would terminate the plan, capture the overfunded or excess asset portion of that plan, and use it for other purposes. Asset reversion was one of the scandals of private pensions. It was, it, the claim was made that plans were overfunded. That resulted from earnings on investments that were greater than had been projected. And so the employer said, that belongs to us, we should take it back. There were those of us who were concerned about the adequacy of planned funding who said, no, we expect funding to go up and down. That should be left there to offset lean years. The government rules that permitted people to take so-called surplus money out of their pension plan, what we call pension rating, uh, was a complete change of the rules of the game. This caught the attention of legislators and participants. And after a number of hearings in the Congress, this particular uh, problem as they saw it was addressed by uh, legislation. Before the early 80s, when there was extra money in the pension fund, it had been used to improve workers' benefits and to provide occasional cost of living adjustments for retirees. The practice of pension rating basically cut that back. The legislation that was used here was to discourage this kind of practice, was to provide a, an excise tax on any assets that would revert to the employer and not be paid as a benefit to participants. Through a series of laws passed in the 1980s, 
Congress amended ERISA to extend pension protection to millions more workers, among them lower paid, shorter service, and older employees. It did this by shortening vesting requirements to five years, changing the way pension plans could coordinate their benefits with Social Security, a process known as pension integration, and requiring that older workers continue to earn benefits if they work beyond normal retirement age. Protections were also extended to widowed and divorced spouses, and insurance coverage was extended through the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation to multi-employer pension plans. But the law was also frequently changed to prevent plans from overly favoring a company's highly paid employees and to stem revenue losses to the U.S. Treasury. It did this by scaling back on how much could be contributed to pension plans and how much highly paid employees could benefit from the plan. In the early 1980s, uh, when we uh, passed the tax cuts, we were facing very significant deficits. And Congress went through an extended period of time where they wanted to raise additional tax revenues without raising tax rates. And the way they did that uh, was by cutting back on what they called tax preferences. And one of the biggest tax preferences in, in, in the tax code today and, and back then were the preferences that favor retirement programs. In this country, tax policy is used to promote important social goals like retirement income security. So there's about $92 billion of revenue that's foregone for various pension programs in this country. It makes sense to limit the amount that employers can deduct to an amount that reasonably funds the promise they have made. You don't want to give the employer excessive tax benefits um, that fund more than the promise. On the other hand, the reverse is where we are right now, where the employer is not allowed to deduct or even contribute to a retirement plan the amount that the employer will need to fulfill the promises they have made to their employees. Pension sponsors and practitioners groaned under the seemingly endless onslaught of new IRS rules and tax law changes. Critics charged that this stifled the growth of defined benefit plans, the traditional plan offered since the beginning of the private pension system in 1875. But others say that these changes were necessary to ensure fairness and equity. One of the primary reasons for the enormous complexity of the pension system is what I would consider to be congressional indifference as to the result of the laws that have been enacted and then regulatory suspicion as to the motivation of employers in sponsoring a plan for their employees. We have a myriad of different sorts of regulations covering the compensation that can be counted, the benefits that can be paid, the conditions under which certain people can get a benefit or not. And in fact, companies spend a tremendous amount of money each year trying to make sure they aren't running afoul of one or another of these regulations. That turns out to be so expensive that small employers have a very difficult time instituting a pension, even if in principle they would like to. A classic example of that was one very simple provision of the 1986 Tax Reform Act, a simple two-line restatement of what really had been the law for many years that says that a pension plan shall not favor the highly compensated employees over the non-highly compensated employees, a concept that certainly all reasonable people would agree with. Well, that simple two-line statute spawned more than 200 pages of implementing regulations from the Internal Revenue Code. And that is just symptomatic of what has happened time and time again in all of these laws that have been enacted over the course of many years. A, a number of us believe that uh, the uh, relentless pursuit of equity by government, by the federal government in the pension regulatory arena uh, has caused a number of companies, especially in the mid-size category, to re-examine the nature of their promises. During the decade of the 1980s, there were more than 80 pages of statute that were added to the Internal Revenue Code enacted by Congress, and that in turn led to more than 600 pages of regulations from the regulatory agencies to implement those laws. The uh, pursuit of regulatory equity from the government's perspective is to make these plans better, more equitable to the participants. The flip side is, is that the additional 
administrative costs, which is significant, has driven many companies out of the system. My advice to Congress would be to take out the weed whacker and, and hack away at the laws that we have in place um, and repeal them whenever possible. To, the easiest way to simplify the system is to have one less rule to deal with. Of course the law is complicated, but there is a great deal at stake here. What's at stake is the retirement security of America's workers and the fairness of the pension system. Any employer can set up a very simple pension plan without any burdensome regulations. The only requirement is that the employer provide benefits for all workers at the same percentage of pay. The complexity comes when the employer wants to favor one group of employees over the other, usually high paid, older employees, like the employer. Then there are rules that must be followed because these are tax subsidized plans. All taxpayers are paying for them. With budget deficits soaring during the 1980s, policymakers looked for ways to increase U.S. Treasury revenues without raising tax rates. They often looked to tax-favored retirement plans to score revenue. The era of the 1980s and early 1990s, when the government was running huge budget deficits, was an era where the tax policy tail was wagging the retirement policy dog where the rules that were enacted to govern the pension system were being dictated by how to extract a few billion dollars here or a few billion dollars there, not on what was good, sound retirement policy. Unfortunately, the private pension system was given short shrift in this debate. The Congress, because of the budget deficit, and the need to raise revenues to meet other national priorities was continually looking for revenues. They found it, unfortunately, too often in the private pension system. Now that we've entered an era, fortunately, of budget surpluses, we have an opportunity to think about what is the proper framework for the retirement system and to do so with the thought in mind as to what makes sense from a retirement policy point of view and not from a tax or revenue point of view. During the 25 years since ERISA was passed, the pension system has changed dramatically. Defined benefit plans, the type of plan that the law was trying to protect, have been ending at a shocking rate. Defined contribution arrangements, like 401k plans, have been growing enormously. Much of this is due to the transformation of American businesses, some of it due to government regulations and tax policy. There has been a significant decline in the number of defined benefit pension plans. In the mid-1980s, we insured about 114,000 plans. That number has now dropped to about 45,000 plans. We've been working very hard with all of the stakeholders to try and arrest these alarming trends to create designs that will truly meet the needs of tomorrow's workforce. It seems to me that if you look at the changing composition of the American workforce, therein lie the seeds of the explanation for why defined contribution plans have been growing. That is, we have a much more diverse workforce. We have more women. We have more minorities. We have a much more portable and mobile workforce. And so because of these changes in the way the American workforce looks, people want pensions that, have, that can adapt to where they'd like to go. I see two real problems with defined contribution plans. One is the investment during the active working lifetime of the individuals, whether the typical employee is really capable of, of making the right investment choices. And then secondly, at retirement, whether or not they uh, should continue to manage their own assets or should buy annuities from insurance companies. And from what I can see, there's very little interest on the part of the employees in annuitizing their accumulation. When a company shifts entirely to a defined contribution arrangement, is there isn't a safety net for the employees, an ability to uh, guarantee returns and also an ability to have an easy mechanism 
for employees to take their big account balances when they retire and transfer them and turn them into annuities for, an, for a, uh, uh, a guaranteed monthly income during retirement years. The proliferation of 401k plans is arguably the most important single phenomenon affecting people's retirement since ERISA. These retirement savings plans have quickly become the overwhelming choice among employers starting retirement programs. Employees seem to love them as well. 401ks are very popular. They're simple, they're portable, but there's no evidence whatsoever that they can do the job of supplementing Social Security for the typical American worker. In fact, all indications are that they can't do the job and that they are substituting for traditional pension and profit sharing plans that could. Workers certainly value their 401k accounts, but these accounts were never designed to be primary retirement vehicles. They were always designed to be supplementary, and workers are certainly not saving enough early enough in life in these accounts to guarantee them a secure retirement. Defined contribution plans, and particularly section 401k plans, have gained tremendously in popularity. These plans give workers both portability and the ability to choose both the amount of money they choose to put away for retirement and their investment options. And while these plans have many good points, they also contain considerable risk and responsibilities. Because they allow workers to elect how much of their wages to defer, there is great danger that low-income workers will not defer any of the income or too little to provide for a secure retirement. You really get out of a risk that was rather significant in the old regime, uh, but you have a new set of problems. The new set of problems are how are we going to turn that amount of money into an old age income? Is it enough? Will it last until I die? ERISA protects the retirement income security of millions of Americans, promotes greater integrity and reliability of the private pension system, and enjoys widespread support. Pension funds have been growing at astronomical rates, tripling in the past decade. Assets now amount to $4 trillion. Over 45 million workers are actively participating in over 700,000 plans, which paid out $165 billion in 1994. Employer-provided pensions and individual retirement savings often make the difference between living in comfort or in poverty. But the changing world presents new challenges to the pension system as the nation heads into the 21st century. Corporate America continues to change. New technologies have created volatile new industries, fast-growing firms, and new modes of business. As global competition and corporate downsizing increase the risk of mid-career job loss, staying with an employer until one's planned retirement age becomes something of a lottery. And preserving the value of pension benefits earned on a prior job, known as pension portability, continues to be an elusive goal. The American labor force has always been a labor force on the move. It has always been a labor force jumping from job to job, employer to employer. Over a lifetime, the average person has eight different jobs, and that doesn't match up very well with a pension plan that assumes long-time employment with a single employer. A person who leaves a job uh, is, is definitely uh, losing pension value if, if the plan is a final average pay pension plan. Consider a person who starts at company A at age 25 and at age 45 is downsized and goes to work for company B. Both companies have final average pay pension plans. Even if that person can make the same salary at company B as he or she was making when they left company A, that person would have lost one-third of their pension benefit. That person's monthly pension check from companies A and B combined will be one-third less than what that person would have received from company A 
had he or she stayed for all 40 years? Something needs to be done about that, and the most obvious thing would be to uh, force the employer to keep that benefit in line with, with uh, cost of living increases. But that is very difficult to persuade employers that that, that is their obligation. The private pension system is very stable at the moment, in my opinion, but I think it does have to expand to, to the uh, almost 50 percent of the workers who do not have a private pension plan. And that will be the challenge to accomplish that goal. The best way to significantly expand pensions is to increase the number of well-paying jobs in our economy. Coverage of private pension plans, those based upon employment with a particular employer or group of employers, has been shrinking. It's been going down. From f for full-time employees, it has fallen below 50 percent. Less than one person out of two at work, full-time, participates in a plan. That's participate. That doesn't mean get benefits. It means participate. I think what's important is what percentage of people, when they get to retirement age, are actually going to get something out of this system. And my estimates are that, that probably nearly three-quarters of all people reaching retirement age are going to get some money from the pension system one way or the other. But benefits based on only part of a worker's career might not be an adequate supplement to Social Security. And most workers not participating in any pension plan work for small employers. We've just undertaken a small employer retirement survey to try and figure out what would it take to get small employers that don't have any type of plan to do so. The most common challenge that small employers say they face is not having profits to provide for a plan. Within the context of small business, if you look at the significant portion that is constituted of uh, the mom and pop stores, the dry cleaner that's around the corner, those, those enterprises are struggling to make ends meet. Their mortality rate, the rate of failure is very high, and they, it, to think that those organizations are going to go to the, the uh, expense of setting up a pension plan for themselves and for their employees is, uh, is really far-fetched in my view. It hasn't happened. I don't think it will happen. When you ask people at the bottom of the wage distribution, would you like an employer pension, implicitly or explicitly, they're going to pay for it out of lower wages. So when you're asking them if they would like a pension, what they're really being asked is, would you take less cash now in exchange for more retirement income later. Interestingly, small employers say their employees don't want a retirement plan. They want health insurance first. And most of those small firms say, and we don't yet have enough money to provide health insurance. After we're profitable, after we've provided health insurance, if we're still around, we might begin providing a retirement plan. There are simple low-cost plan options for their employees, like SEPs and simple plans. Also, there are payroll deduction IRAs that cost the employer nothing. In spite of all the pension protections enacted by ERISA, workers today still face a number of labor market risks that will affect their retirement security. You might lose your job, you might become unemployed, you might find that your skills simply aren't that valuable. Sometimes companies go out of business. Sometimes companies don't invest their pension plans in the way they were supposed to. People need to know what decisions they make in their lives that can have an impact on their retirement savings. Often people make decisions in their lives that affect their retirement security, but they might not think about it. When they take a job, leave a job, get married, get divorced, all of these are examples of life decisions that can affect retirement security. Clearly, workers today have to face risks that were unforeseen in 1974. They risk putting too little of their wages into their 401k plans, of investing the money poorly, of taking the money out for current expenses when they switch jobs, rather than rolling it over into another savings vehicle. Risk will always be with us. There will always be capital market risk. There will always be some global economic risk. 
And so this really speaks to the question of how much can the government protect us? For many employers, traditional defined benefit plans do not meet the needs of today's workforce. Employers are telling us that they need more flexibility to meet the needs of both their younger workers and their older workers. Younger workers want a more flexible account that they can take from one job to the next. Older workers want a traditional defined benefit. Employers want designs that will make it possible for them to meet the needs of both their younger workers and their older workers. Over the past 15 years, companies have started to adopt what I would call hybrid plans. Plans that have some of the characteristics of the traditional defined benefit plan and some of the characteristics of the traditional defined contribution plan. With the final average uh, salary formula, most of your benefits accrue in the last 10 or 15 years. Well, younger employees are now becoming aware of that, and they, they prefer a defined contribution plan or one of these plans that are called a cash balance plan, where they do more for the short service and younger employees and for the older. They have the defined benefit characteristics of guarantees. The individual is guaranteed the investment return. The company takes the entire investment risk. The individual is guaranteed the right to annuitize that benefit within the plan at retirement with the company taking the longevity risk. PBGC insures cash balance plans because they are defined benefit plans that provide a guaranteed income stream for life. The principal problem with cash balance plans is that for many older workers they represent a change in the rules of the game when it's too late. These are workers who work for 20, sometimes 30 years counting on a particular amount at retirement age. Suddenly they're told there's a new plan and they're not going to get what they expected to get. What started as a trickle is turning into a stream. While benefits already earned are protected, the employer is free to make changes affecting future years. Even if it comes at a time when a worker is getting into the most valuable part of the old plan. Many employers are just adopting these new types of plans because they feel they better meet their workforce uh, management objectives and they better reflect the company's culture. When a pension plan is changed from its current status, usually a final pay plan, to a new plan, for example, a cash balance, but it's not the only type of change, usually there are folks that could be hurt in the transition, that is that their benefits either are uh, don't go up as fast or may even stay frozen for a, a number of years. There are strategies available and companies, most companies, employ one or more of the available strategies in easing the uh, transition from old plan to new plan. Often employees don't understand what's happening to their benefits when the company moves to a cash balance plan. And this is troubling to me, but I think we need to start at a different place. And that is that employees didn't understand their benefits before the company made the switch. They didn't understand the traditional plan. This idea of an income at age 65, for somebody that's far away from 65, it's hard to understand the time value of money. Age 65 seems really far away, and it's just a hard thing to think about. While Americans may have a good understanding of the longer lives that they can expect, will they have enough resources? Retirement is expensive. Long life is a great gift. But this gift must be financed. We worry about what's going to happen to Medicare. We worry about what's going to happen to Social Security. We worry about all of these things. We see it in the headlines every day uh, about people are not going to have enough income off of these programs to protect themselves. I don't think the American lives who hasn't heard that Social Security is going to hell because there aren't enough young people to support too many old people. That we've got this bulge of the baby boomers and they haven't had enough kids, and so when the baby boom hits retirement starting about 2012, 2013, there aren't going to be enough people, young people to support them. I think the greatest retirement income challenge today is the prospect of individuals having to work forever. 
The bottom line dynamic is that individuals need, with extended life expectancy, to have enough money to take care of the potential crisis of long-term care, to be able to provide for medical expenses, and to be able to maintain a lifestyle. That has always taken substantial resources, but in a world that has increasingly become focused on consumption and having a good time today, is it really becomes more and more important that people prepare and prepare themselves. The key to changing our nation's savings culture is to communicate that message to our youth. The consumer society is so heavy, is so uh, alluring. So I'm not going to stay here and say, you tell the 25-year-old to save because otherwise he or she is going to be in deep trouble. Save your breath. The need to save has never been greater, particularly for the millions who do not have employer-provided pensions. The 1998 National Summit on Retirement Savings was a great bipartisan success. Imagine the president, vice president, and the leadership of both houses in Congress together discussing the need to educate Americans about retirement savings. It really underscored the importance of this issue for the American people. The SAVER Act, which was signed into law in 1997, institutionalized this ongoing educational effort. The Department of Labor is reaching out far and wide to increase understanding of the importance of retirement savings for all Americans. Savings are vital to everyone's retirement. Nothing else, you should remember that. Savings are vital to everyone's retirement, and that's particularly so in the 21st century. There's an economic boom now. There's a sense of prosperity. Um, I think many Americans believe the stock market is invincible and inviolable and will continue at this heady pace for another 25 years. Um, and if people carry around such a positive worldview, then they can continue to defer, to defer savings. People are saving. They're saving for their homes. And they're saving for their kids' education. By the time they start saving for retirement, it's too little, too late. I think that people uh, need to understand that they're going to live longer than a lot of them think they're going to live. They're going to have to protect that uh, longevity. In order to do that, they're going to have to have some products uh, that will be able to protect them, uh, not only from a tax standpoint, but from a protection standpoint. And annuities are the way to go. The beauty of an annuity is that it actually protects you from outliving your assets. In many families, there is a long period of widowhood. Often, the women outlive their husbands, and we see a major decline in economic status at time of widowhood. So in retirement planning, I would like to see people think about, how do I take care of myself, but what happens when one of us dies, and will we have the assets to last for both of our lives. Sometimes couples don't elect a joint and survivor benefit because they feel that the reduction in benefits that they would take would just be too much of a sacrifice when they both are living. So they would rather take the chance of having uh, no income after the first death than uh, take that reduction uh, while they're both living. The key is to get something they can't outlive. And the annuity is the only thing that they can put into place that they cannot outlive. Individuals don't understand how to convert a lump sum of money into an annuity. And in fact, from our surveys, individuals are shocked by how small the annuity is that what they think is a lot of money will purchase for them. People, I think, tend to feel very rich when they have $100,000 in their account, not understanding that they could well live 20 or 30 or heaven forbid, even more years into retirement. And so dividing that $100,000 over 20 or 30 years simply doesn't take you very far. 
I think the insurance companies are going to play a huge role in the retirement income security in the future. Uh, the products that we have that can protect you, uh, whether it's life insurance or uh, uh, whatever it happens to be, but especially annuities. Annuities allow you to, to put something into place that will protect you long term, provide you an income that you can't outlive. There are some new products that I think will interest retirement savers at the point when they have to decide what to do with their money. But focusing people on the need for an annuity is a very difficult challenge at present. They need to remember that the uh, insurance company is providing an annuity over a 10 or 15 or 20 year period, possibly 25 for, for life. And what might uh, look at any particular point as being an inadequate uh, return uh, in the long run might be perfectly adequate because there's no question that insurance companies can invest money as efficiently as, as banks or mutual funds or any other asset managers. We have a number of additional challenges and personal knowledge is probably the biggest one. Financial literacy across the, the spectrum of age and income uh, leaves an awful lot to be desired need to know about their pension plans, but they need to know about their total asset portfolio and retirement savings. Most Americans don't know what the age will be at which they'll be eligible for full benefits under Social Security. Most Americans don't know what the dollar amount of their Social Security benefit will be. Half of Americans don't know the difference between a stock and a bond. Nearly two-thirds of Americans think that a money market fund is made up of stocks. That is why the President has directed the National Economic Council to work with the Departments of Labor, Treasury, Education, and other federal agencies and organizations to develop a plan for financial literacy in this country. Many wonder where we go from here. Will our retirement income security system continue to be a two-class system? One of the haves and the have-nots? I think the biggest challenge that we face looking ahead is how to structure the appropriate balance between what the government does for us, what an employer can help us do, and what we must do as individuals and within our family to prepare for our old age. You can look around the world. When people reach retirement, they like to maintain standards of living that are roughly equivalent to their pre-retirement standards of living. And if they haven't accumulated assets on their own to help meet that through pensions or through their own personal saving, they often come back to the government through political processes and, and have the government finance that. So either we pay the piper now or we pay the piper later. This is a real a three-way game. There's employers providing benefits, employees who are going to get benefits and manage their retirement income, and the government, for their part, making sure everybody is playing fair and square. And the question, of course, is to keep it all in balance. So what we have to carefully structure is an environment where the government does what it can by way of regulation and then teaches us and explains to us what it cannot do. In looking ahead to retirement income adequacy, we have to look at the larger picture, the basic building block of retirement income for the bulk of the population is Social Security. There's just no blinking at that. We don't really know what will happen to Social Security in the future. So if benefits have to be cut back in order to keep Social Security solvent, that might actually provide a boost for the private pension system because there will be a need to substitute private provision for what the government used to do. If you look at the government, it too is going through a transition. It went from being completely out of the game to coming into the game in a very, very heavy-handed way. ERISA was a fine piece of legislation that established some very, very important minimum standards. We needed that legislation. Uh, and even though there are shortcomings today and even though there is over-regulation, I would not go back, no one would go back the way things were before. The private pension system has undergone significant changes since the days of the gold watch and chain. It has evolved from a system that enticed older workers to leave the firm with a promise of lifetime benefits 
to a system designed to attract younger, more mobile employees by offering cash they can take with them. And pensions remain voluntary. No employer is required to provide one. If workers want to retire someday, they will have to work for an employer sponsoring a pension plan or save on their own. They may need to do both. I think the biggest issue today is the question of whether we should have defined contribution plans or defined benefit plans. I think defined contribution plans offer portability, adaptability. They're easier to understand in many ways than defined benefit programs used to be. And on top of all those other benefits, defined contribution plans off also offer people, the individual, individual investors, the chance to invest in the stock market. What we know we're going to get is we're going to get some people who are going to do very, very well and have loads of money in retirement, and we're going to have some people that can do very, very poorly who are not going to have much at all. And how we deal with that, if there's any way to take the risk out of the system to secure our old age, is, I think, the challenge that we all face going forward. Americans are enchanted with the stock market and defined contribution plans give them the option to play out that infatuation. The market can't continue to, to go up uh, in, indefinitely. And when, uh, when that happens, I think there may be a reassessment of the relative merits of defined benefit versus defined contribution. I think that if we were to experience some kind of a, a significant market correction uh, where employees lost a lot of value in their defined contribution plan accounts that uh, d we could see a resurgence in defined benefit plans. Today it's very easy for us to think about the great stock market of the last few years and rewards of great investment performance. But if we look at the pension system over the past years, there are strings of good years and there are periods of bad years. That younger worker better make sure that he doesn't uh, put all his faith uh, uh, in, in the stock market because it's like walking on water. You go down. For better or for worse, the American public has seen a fantastic period of stock market returns. So even I individuals who were in defined benefit plans of the old-fashioned variety now feel left behind if they don't have a chance to play in the stock market. So for a variety of reasons, workforce reasons, stock market reasons, it seems like defined contribution plans very much are the wave of the future. The story used to be one of, it was a paternalistic system. Companies did it all. And that is changing dramatically for the good of both the employers and the employees. Employees will increasingly in the future be asked to take more responsibility for for managing their own retirement income. The total system of pensions has changed radically since ERISA. We essentially have seen defined benefit pension plans in somewhat of a death spiral, and those that still exist are largely changing, much, much more in the way of lump sum distributions and new plans that focus on individual accounts. In the defined contribution realm, we have seen fairly substantial growth of programs but again, that represents a shift to individual accounts and lump sum distributions, as opposed to the good old days when people got annuities from pensions. We already have a two-class system in retirement. Uh, people with pensions uh, do very well. People without pensions can't pay their bills in retirement. Our concern is, is that employers, as employers retreat from pensions, uh, and increasingly tell workers to do it themselves, that this tremendous gap is going to widen. If you don't save yourself, you'd better not count on anybody doing it for you. Now, obviously, there's Social Security as a foundation of income, but for most Americans, Social Security will never be adequate retirement income. I think that it's very important for workers as they're going through their careers to pay attention to how much they're going to need to meet their, their own retirement consumption levels. And they need to make sure that, that they are preparing themselves. They need to ask their employers how much they need given their retirement plans. They need to plan. They need to save. These are extremely important things 
they must keep in mind that there are no free lunches here. We need a continuous education effort to have individuals realize be it ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars or more, it's never too early to save and it certainly is never too early to start rolling over lump sum distributions. So if we educate individuals, we'll be in a far, far stronger case. If we don't see saving now, when America is in the richest position it's been in, in just dozens of years, when are we going to see it? We need to be teaching people basic financial concepts. In some ways, the problem with understanding pension plans is a little bit like if we gave somebody a great set of information in German, but they don't speak German, they don't understand it. It's critical to teach people about compound interest, to teach people about th simple things like life expectancy. And that is something that people can be taught about. Helping people understand the nature of risk is somewhat more complicated, but I think it's absolutely essential. Because if we don't, then as policymakers and as educators, we're not doing our jobs. We must sell educators, employers, and community leaders on the importance of retirement savings education and get their support behind the idea of collective responsibility for individual action. Today, the only excuse for not being prepared and for not knowing the right answers is because you failed to ask the questions. It's no longer that the answers aren't available. It's whether or not each of us understands that we better ask them, and frankly, that the long-term consequence of not asking them is very possibly, as you celebrate your 85th birthday, uh, pulling out the want ads and seeing what there is that you can go do for the next 20 years. Days a day, I get my gold, watch and change. Engraved with 30 years of service and my name. Men with pinstripe suits and ties shake my hand as they walk by. Days a day, I get my gold, watch and change. Major funding for this program has been provided by the Department of Labor, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, Deloitte and Touche, and the Actuario Foundation. One more day. And then at five o'clock you sent me on my way. I've been a working man since birth. Now this watch is all I'm worth. Today's the day I get my gold watch and chain. said my name men with pinstripe suits and ties shake my hand as they walk by today's the day i get my gold watch and chain men with pinstripe suits and ties shake my hand as they walk by today's the day i get my gold watch and chain